watching. We thank God to heal you. Fix your elevator. And it's amazing how, how God desires to be with each and every one of us. It's so precious. And, and let me just tell you, there's that feeling that we get of unworthiness. But that's just your flesh. God knows you're going to eject that when we get caught up. Can you say amen? Well, I have some great things to share with you. I'm fired up. We don't want to keep you long. You've had a busy week, right? Amen. How many here just had a great Thanksgiving? You know, we, Linda and I had to do a lot of praying during this particular week and what we should do, what we shouldn't do. And so the Lord allowed us to do some things and allowed us not to do some things. You know, sometimes you'll just say, you know, why don't you just do this instead? And, you know, I appreciate everything God says because it's always good. It's always perfect. It's the better choice. And so I like to listen to him and go to him. Now, a lot of times our Christianity, we just get moving, we're grooving, we're doing things. And oftentimes we don't stop and be still long enough to know that he's God. And I just appreciate you coming today. And Lord God, let's all join and bless those that are watching because we have a lot of people, a lot today, that are out because of different things. And so we want to bless them, right? In Jesus' name, say, we bless them. Let them hear you over the mic. We bless them, yeah. All right. Peggy, put that pickle down. All right. I mean, I know that. She's watching, BJ's watching, a few people are watching, normally are here. Anyway, we've been studying what we call new creation realities. I've got something unusual for you today, and we're going to just call it nuggets of truth. How many know that in the scripture, there's little nuggets that pop out at you once in a while? Now, I don't know about you, but I, I've always liked to pan for gold. You know, I don't know why I got gold fever. It's probably because my dad was a miner and he loved gold too and it passed on to me so he took us out one time and we went out panning for gold and we actually got some and boy I did did I get that I think they call it gold feeder fever where you're oh everything we're gonna be a millionaire dad says oh, you know, that's about a dollar and a half you spent all day long getting that but the idea is that God's word is like treasure. And just to go through it and cover the surface, you're not going to get much. And I'm not trying to put anybody down. You got to dig for those treasures. One of the things my dad told me, he says, when you're around and you want to find gold, gold sips to the bottom. It's heavy. So if you're around like a, um, a river or a creek or where a wash is, you want to dig down about six to nine feet below that wash. And there you're going to find your gold. If there's any there, he was correct, you know, but who wants to dig nine, ten feet? But sometimes what I'm just saying is digging in the scripture, finding out truths, things that you need or desire to know, very important to God. And God just loves it because he says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be everyone filled Amen. So that's you. Glory to God. So we're going to call this nuggets of truth. Let's turn and read our scripture in Proverbs. Okay. Before we get to reading that, I want to say this. The word fear does not mean to be afraid. The word fear here, where it says fear the Lord, it means to respect him with the thought of where would we go without him? So it's a reverent fear. It's kind of like if you've never played with electricity, there's a reverent fear there. Otherwise, you'll get a little spark. You know, certain things are, that are apprehensive, apprehensive to you, you know. And so God says the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. So for us to respect God, respect the fact that we don't want to ever be away from God. Shows us that God will give us the wisdom because we need his wisdom in this earth that's fallen to be able to successfully live our lives, have children or our loved ones, build a family, business, all these things that God says that we can do. Can you say amen? But we do have a spiritual outlaw who's in this planet and his job is to hinder 
frustrate, cause people to think what he's doing is of God. And a lot of times people will buy into it. I mean, we heard the package, that song, the package. Here's the devil showing up at the front door and he says, hey, would you like to have this? Would you like to have that? I says, why did God send things here by you? Remember the words? And he says, he always sends me when there's dirty work to do. And see, that's where a lot of Christianity is. There's a lot of wonderful, wonderful Christians. Some of them are my friends that still think God is putting them through the mud and putting them in the crud and keeping, trying to keep them from the flood, you know, and by some reason teaching the lesson through all of this. My goodness, that's not our father. That's not our Lord Jesus Christ. So I tell young people who are searching scripture, if you want to know what God is like, <clears throat> I've done a lot of singing. If you want to know, excuse me, if God is like, study Jesus. Study the life of Jesus when he was here as a man. Look at the way he talked to people. How he never pushed his way into somebody's life. Look at his mannerisms. And I also tell people, because I'm, I'm really pleased in the series, even though I haven't seen a whole lot of it, the series, The Chosen. You get a chance to watch the series. And the first two years are free of the series. And what I want you to watch is how Jesus interacted with everybody. Religion doesn't paint that kind of picture of our Lord. He doesn't paint that kind of picture of our Father. Religion paints a picture that if you don't look out, he's going to dig him. You're suffering the stuff because you've been such a disobedient child. And that's the kind of stuff that religion teaches. Now, who would be the author, just by that definition alone, who would be the author of religion? It wouldn't be God, would it? Karl Marx, the guy that wrote Communism manifesto, he says that religion's the opiate of the people. Makes you feel like you're doing something, but you're never getting anywhere. Like that little squirrel that runs around. It makes you think good and everything, but we're never, we're never getting anywhere. And the only time you get anywhere is when you stop and it throws you out. So you can identify that we're not preaching religion. We want to have you have such a relationship with God that you fall so in love with him that God is willing to open up his mysteries to you. And so we're going to share some of those mysteries tonight or today. Nuggets of truth. Okay. So let's read our scripture. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me, this is talking about by God, this is a prophecy. For by me, your days will be multiplied and your years of life will be added to you. Everybody say amen. amen. And then verse 12, if you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you will bear it alone. Now, I, I left that scripture in there to let you know, if people think they're wise without God, what is that really? It's just foolishness. Amen. Because is God impressed with any of our wisdom? No. All good wisdom comes from God, Mike. Amen. And then it says scoffing. Look at that word scoff. Let me share something God shared with me. It wasn't too long, about 12 years ago. He says, son, that in the last days, now you spoke to Peter and Paul about this. In the last days, scoffers will come. These are people that scoff at everything. Hey, I got blessed today. Eh scoffing, putting down, making fun of, uh, coming against, scoffing. Scoffers will come. Now, see, it's not what they're scoffing, because a great temptation for Christians is to scoff the devil, you know. Now, when a turkey, you know, call him slew foot, split toe, cling on, you know, to scoff at him. But see, even Michael the archangel did not bring railing accusations against him. Why? Because the doing of scoffing or the practice of scoffing, doesn't matter if it's something you feel needs to be scoffed or something that shouldn't be scoffed. The, the whole practice of scoffing is a tool Satan used to get at you. 
It's kind of like being angry and not sinning. Now, who do you know can do that? Only God, Jesus. Hello? So we know if we're going to have anger, we better get it under the blood real quick before we go and say or do something that we don't want to do that. Can you say amen? Scoffing is much the same way. It opens the door for the enemy to attack us. And your pastor loves you so much, only a teeny bit compared to how much God loves you. You know, I, I'm nothing, nowhere, but he wants you protected. He wants you taught well. He wants you to understand what the will of the Lord is. He wants you to understand that without God, there's no hope. But with God, we have wisdom and understanding. The fear of the Lord gives us that wisdom, knowing that we need his wisdom. Because the wisdom which is from above, in, in James it says, is first of all pure. Easy to be t taught. You could be taught. If you have, you're operating in the wisdom above, people can approach you and say, can I share something with you? And you go, oh, sure. Instead of, what are you going to share? You see the difference? Anyway, so today we're just going to have fun bringing up some, some nuggets. Maybe you knew some of this. Maybe you didn't. Or maybe we got out of the practice of some of this. All right. Everyone say, the fear of the Lord, the of the Lord. gives me wisdom. Because I know there's nowhere else to go. Nothing else, nothing else but Jesus. Amen. All right, so as we study this morning, I want to give you some nuggets of truth. That I can't give you all the nuggets of truth that I have found in here. I found so many. And these are nuggets of truth that will blow religion out of the water. Why were the religious people so angry at Jesus when he came? Because everything Jesus did was the practice of the law by grace. And he blew them out of the water. So they hated him because he did not practice their religion. Now, folks, do we have problems like that today? Churches don't agree with other churches because... We don't practice what they think is the truth. Same devil. Same immaturity. Instead of us getting caught up in what people are doing, let's be caught up what God wants to give us of his wisdom so people can look at us and say, wow, brother, you must be a real down-to-earth Christian because I can't find anything that's hypocritical about you. That's us. We'll all claim that. Say amen. Because <laughs> you are. You're sincere. So God covers all your flaws when you're sincere and your heart's sincere to him. So you don't have to run around trying to fix yourself all the time. Please don't. Get yourself to God and let him fix you. Amen. How often should I go? As often as you need to be fixed. Hey, Daniel was in such bad condition, not personally, because he was distraught because the Israelites were held captive by the Babylonian group for 70 years. It says when he sought the Lord, he sought him seven times a day. He had to because of the oppression and the different things that were going on. If you want to study about politics in a biblical way, study the book of Daniel and see all the problems he had. And then you don't put your faith in politics. Say amen. Not say, oh me. We as Christian believers should know how to and practice the truths I'm going to give you. These are, are the kinds of wisdom we call common sense. Okay? And you know, Christianity is built on equity and common sense. Amen. All right? You got no gas in your car? Don't run around and say, I'm living on faith. While you're standing by the freeway with a gas can. Come on, we need to get the right stuff. Can you say amen? So I won't meddle there too much. But if you go with me to Matthew, amen. It says, the secret place is where we start our day. The secret place is where we start our day. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. Very familiar scripture. I use it a lot. Because without prayer, you are worthless. What do you mean? Let me clarify. Without you being in prayer and God working in our life, the things that we do seem to come to nothing. So it gives that, that sensation of worthlessness. 
And that's what the enemy wants to do. Make us all feel like we're not anybody. We're not, you know, we're always, in, you know, just in the flux for the purpose of keeping our mind on ourself. Amen. You see, I don't want to keep my mind on myself. What a boring subject. I don't want to think about what I should have, what I could have. I have no regrets because yesterday's gone. It's covered in the blood and I let it go. So if you go to God and you say, God, remember that thing I, I said wrong yesterday? And God says, huh? No, remember, I insulted my wife. I'm making this up, so please, I'm making it up. I insulted the, my wife. I'll just use her because she's she'll love me. And I'm really sorry. You remember that yesterday when I did that? And God will say, huh? The only thing he might say is, didn't you ask me to forgive you? Yeah. He says, I remember it no more. Why don't you do the same? That's worth a million dollars. What I just said. Because it didn't come from me. It just... Why don't we do the same? Anyway, so let's go on. So Matthew 6, 6 says, but when you pray, notice it didn't say if you pray. Mike, I hope you got a good, strong prayer language, good, strong prayer with God. Yeah, you. Amen. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut the door, in other words, shut the world out, pray to your father who's in the secret place. And again, you've heard me preach about the secret place. The secret place follows you around. It's the realm of the spirit. Now, what have I told you? What does the word say? The word says Satan can't go into your realm of the spirit. So the best thing you need to do is what Paul encourages us to do. In Galatians 5, 16, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, Father, teach me. How to walk in the spirit in the realm of the secret place so I cannot be harassed. Your, 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 your family says, come on, Carrie, I'm going to take you down to Seattle. We're going to go down to the market. My mind's going, oh, God, protect me. Because when you go down there without protection, you're going to get harassed. So if you know you're in a fallen world, you're around a certain situation where you have to be. You pray. You cover yourself. Can you say amen? You're blessed. So when you pray, go into your room. Shut everything else out. Close the door. Why? Because you're going to focus on God. Then you meet with God in the secret place. And you have what you call a face-to-face -face relationship. Let me explain. If I have a face-to-face -face relationship, I'm sitting down with my wife. Having a face-to-face. -face. We're both looking at each other's face talking. When you sit down in prayer, you need to imagine God's faith. And he's sitting right there listening to you. And speak to him. Lift up your face and speak to him. He loves your face. And speak to him. He's listening. Are you with me? Most Christians don't get that. They don't have an easy feeling when they go to pray. Because Satan is reminding them of their past. You're already forgiven. You have no guilt, no condemnation. You're God's child. Again, he will not bring up your faults. Yesterday is gone. Ask God to cleanse you. You got a clean slate. Say amen. Only those things you did in God will remain. So go ahead and close the door and meet with your father in the secret place. And your father who meets with you in the secret place place listen to this next phrase shall reward us openly so us by us meeting with God daily face to face meeting with him having that picks up time having that prayer time he rewards us for that what does he reward us with Pastor Kerry blessings Health, wealth, everything that he is gets on you. That's what prayer is all about. Getting you out of the way and getting everything God is on and in you. That's what prayer is. You're loading up. You're plugging in your phone. You're sucking up the juice, man. 
You get there and you love on them. What if I can't feel a thing? What if I just, I, I sit and it's just like I'm just sitting. That's because you're sitting in your head. You got to open your heart. 15 inches of disaster versus blessing. Hello? Well, let's get into this, shall we? So, we need to meet with God in the secret place. God doesn't hang out any other where. What do you, I thought God was all in the atmosphere we breathe. That's right. But the only way for you to access that presence in the atmosphere that you breathe is by Jesus. So I want to try to paint this picture with you before we go on. The way in which we come face to face with God is by being aware of him. First thing, we say, Father, in Jesus' name, that gets us to be aware of him. That's a locative thing. It's going on your phone and going, uh, last week's message. You know, you say, Father, in Jesus' name, boom. Now you're in the spirit. That's all it takes. Father, in Jesus, let's try that. Father, in Jesus' name. Now you're in the spirit. If you ever wondered from your car to the church, if you might have lost the Holy Spirit, no. Whenever you need to be aware of God, just simply address the Father, Father in Jesus' name. Do it with your heart, not your head. And a boom, God will be right there going, okay. Yes, Sherry, what do you want? To have God give you an audience like that, what I wanted you to try to understand is the love that's involved of him doing that for you. And why it's such a disgusting thing for people to play light with God when he's so willing to come to where we are and sit face to face with us. And that's besides God dwelling in us, dwelling around us. That's besides us being filled, full, all the other things that we are. Now, with all of this stuff, when I was studying um, for the ministry for years and years and years and years, all the information that they taught us were all who we are in Christ. And I found out after a little bit of time, my goodness, this is who I am? And God says, yeah, that's who you are. I said, well, I've been living far below that. And God says, yeah, I'm trying to get my people to come seek me. Let me give them the wisdom, all the stuff that they need so their eyes of their understanding can get broadened and they may know. He says, but the world's been pounded on you. I, I'm, I forgot how old I am. I think I'm 67, maybe 68. I'm not sure. I'm old. Anyway. Those of you who are older than me, just act young. But I'm, I'm finding out that, you know, some of us old people, we're pretty stubborn. We need to ask God, God, fix me so I can learn. I need to learn again like a child. Say, oh, me, somebody. Oh, me, somebody. All right. A couple of points. When we step from one reality to the other, when we pray, Father, in Jesus' name, we move from the physical into the spiritual. Always remember that. Every time you say, Father, in Jesus' name, you moved into the spirit realm. God sees to it. Now, here's the problem. A lot of people will say, Father, in Jesus' name, and then they'll sit there and think in their mind. Lord, bless my kids. They'll think, bless my grandkids. Bless all of this and everything like that. One day I was doing that. I was doing that. And God said to me, he says, what are you doing, Carrie? I love that when he says that to me. And he says, well, I'm, I'm kind of praying. He says, no, you're not praying. You're thinking. Good thoughts. And they're wonderful. And I appreciate them. He says, but I need you to voice things so my covenant goes into operation. The angels hearken diligently to the voice of God's word. Everyone take your Bible and put it up to your ears. Do you hear anything? No. You have to voice God's word and for it to become reality. Voice the word, not our problems. Say amen. So one day again, after he taught me thinking is not praying, even though I meant well, and I'm not putting anybody down. Then he told me one time I was praying up a storm. Oh God, you don't know. I'm going through this and have situations and I wonder about this. And God says, Carrie, what are you doing? 
I says, God, I'm praying. He says, you're not praying. You're complaining. I need you to speak my word so I can answer it. I don't answer complaints. I don't put squeaky goo on squeaky wheels. I'll help. But until you enact my word by speaking it, I cannot help. Because you have not because you ask not. Asking is speaking, not thinking. So in your prayers, out loud, Michael. Out loud. All right. Two, though our faithful meeting with God is what's going to mature us. Faithful meeting with God. That really takes a death to self. Folks, even for some people, just coming to church is a... It's like pulling nails. Some people, they'll go to church, but... The whole time they're at, now please don't, I'm not picking on any of you. The whole time they're at church, their mind is somewhere else. So they're physically there, but their mind's somewhere else. You have to come and really focus on the Lord to get what God wants for you to get. Say amen. And you'll say, well, Pastor Kerry, he rewards us openly. How does he do that? Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And he's the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So God wants consistent coming. I would say daily. Consistent coming to God daily. Say amen. And we are covered in the blood and the light when we do that. Blood of Jesus. Remember that? Passover. Passover. They coated the houses with the blood of Jesus and the death angel passed over. Well, Satan's a death angel. Satan and all his cohorts are, are the death people, okay? He has to pass over the blood of Jesus. So in your prayers, every time you go to meet with God, it says if you walk in the light as Christ in the light, the blood is constantly put on you. Like an automatic shower. But when we're not seeking God, when we're not praying, when we're doing our own thing, then what happens is the blood begins to get lighter and lighter and the sludge begins to show up. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God you're not a piece of sludge. <laughs> I'm not going to say that to her. Why not? I, no, don't do that. Anyway, you think about it. So your armor never falls off. The blood of Jesus never completely goes away it just dims and when it dims we show up we go to God to hide in Christ okay we want to stay hidden in Christ all day long that doesn't mean we lose our personality no that means we're able to do everything with a minimize of frustration Jesus says, the wicked one cometh and he finds nothing in me to get a hold of. Jesus constantly, daily, presented himself before the Father. Constantly asked the Father for help. That which I see my Father do, that I do. That which I hear my Father speak, that do I speak. How about you? Do you hear your Father? Is he guiding your steps? Say amen, somebody. Okay. So, what else, Pastor Curry? What would be our reward then? If we diligently seek him, if we meet with him in the secret place, what would be our reward? Well, let's look at this one. How about Psalms 91? The whole psalm. But we're just going to look at the first verse. What does it say? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the almighty shall abide under the shadow of almighty God. I didn't quote it quite right, but that's what it says. So that means if you hang out, meet with God, you're going to abide under his influence and not your own. Someone say, amen. So what is that going to be like? Well, the people that were Jesus' Jesus's disciples had been with Jesus and his glory and his wisdom got on them. They were fishermen. They could cut the fly paper off the flywall. You know what I mean? They're just 
down-to-earth people, but they had been with Jesus often enough for he changed them. How many Christians do you know that they love God, they appreciate God, but you don't see much change in them? Because you're wise now, what are they lacking? Prayer. They have no personal prayer life. And so they're going on mom's prayers or they're running on grandma's prayers, which is good. But people who say they're Christians, but their lives are just ripped all apart, have no prayer life. They gossip too much. They hold odd against other people. They're always talking about what's wrong with everything. They scoff. They do these things. It keeps them in a flux of unsettlement, and they're unable for God to protect them. It'd be like this. There's Carrie. Oh, bless Carrie. He sure loved me. Oh, why did he go? Quick, go to him. He messed up. I get myself straight down. Oh, man, there's Carrie. God's loving me and looking at me. Whoa, oh, he messed up again. No, God's not like that. He lives in you. He knows before you're going to do something wrong. If you're listening to tell you, that would be wrong if you did that. Hello? You guys are so quiet in here. And so, anyway, we're going to cover these four things quickly. Number, number one, these four things and these little nuggets, okay? Start your day off with prayer. We know to do that. But here's the little nugget. Finish your day off the same way. See, everybody meets with God now, and they're starting to think that's really cool. When we always should have been doing it. And at night, what happens is we, we say goodnight to the Lord, but we don't lock the door. Now, we talked about this, so I'm going to go real quick. The nugget is at night, you go to sleep. When you go to sleep, if you don't plead the blood and you ask God to cover your dreams and your body, then your subconscious mind becomes open to some of the enemy's suggestions. Now, not all the time, but I remember when I first got saved, I used to have these terrible nightmares all the time. Wake up with sweats and doing all crazy things. And I asked, I went to my pastor and I said, what's going on? He says, are you pleading the blood of Jesus over your dreams? And he says, well, I never thought to. He says, and the reason being is you used to be the devils. Now you're not the devils anymore. You, you belong to God. So he wants you back. So what does he do? He starts a fear tactic. Starts giving you these things. Worry about this. Worry about that. Boom, 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 boom. Instead, cast that care over on me and plead the blood so you can sleep. He gives his beloved sweet sleep, it says. Say amen. All right. So start your day off with prayer and finish it with a lock at night. We'll, co we'll cover that briefly too. The Lord's Prayer is a modeled station of prayers. The Lord's Prayer is in some form. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our, day, our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beautiful prayer. Those are stations. Our Father who art in heaven, station one, Greek God. Hallowed be your name, station two. Honor him and his name. Station three, thy kingdom come. Now, it came at Pentecost, but what you're asking is God's kingdom be manifest in you so when you lay hands on the sick, they recover. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So these are stations that when we are praying to God in the morning, cover these stations. It's like baseball. You got to hit... The ball, and then go to first base, second base, third base, and then finally home. These are stations to cover in your prayer. Now, you don't have to be legalistic about it. You don't have to be locked into that. I use them as stations to talk around those things. Lead us not into temptation, Father. Everybody in our church, in Jesus' name, don't let them be deceived, tricked. Somebody lied to them about anything. 
Thank you, Father, that you will keep them. You see? So these are stations that I stop at and I pray for. So the Lord's Prayer is an, a model prayer. It's a stationary what to cover when you pray. And then thirdly, when praying, forgive and release. A lot of Christians don't know that this is a big nugget. When you're praying, forgive and release everyone. Father, I come in Jesus' name. I forgive and I release everyone of any debt, even if they're thinking about it and haven't done it yet. And you cover that, see. Hello. Are you with me? So, you forgive and you release them. Lord, I release so-and-so in Jesus' name. I don't know what they're doing, but I can tell. Uh, I just release them in Jesus' name, and Lord, watch over them, keep them. And then I start describing the beautiful painting that God wants for their life. Your words are paintbrushes. Your words are paint. Use the words to stroke, giving God the flow to move in. Invitation causes restoration. I don't preach myself happy. Okay. You guys writing down all this good stuff? Bless your heart. And then finally, fourth thing is blocking inroads of the devil. Learning to block the inroads of the devil. How many know you can't go a day without unforgiveness? In unforgiveness? You just need to be forgiven every day. If you think you can go a week without prayer, you are really deceived. I can't go an entire day without it. I pray, get all of that taken care of, have God fully in charge of my life. Then I get up and God and I walk through our day. The days are much better. <laughs> say amen. Can you say amen? It is just much better than me trying to follow God along the way. Slight different wordage, all the difference in the world. All right. So first point, start your day off with prayer. We, we've covered that through, through many meetings. Okay, and finish it the same way at night. I like what it says in Psalms. Go with me to Psalm 63, verse 1. You guys are so blessed. Amen. Psalm 63, verse 1. It says, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. In other words, as a deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. See, inside you long for God. Outside, we're so busy trying to establish ourselves. No, die. Die out. To die to self means to die to your selfish ways that would cause all arguments and all frustrations. So you say, Lord, crucify me. Lord, help me to die off to myself and that, that I would live spiritually. I meet with God also for him to kill my body and to make it usable for my spirit and soul to use my body as what it's designed for. You see, my car does not drive me. I drive my car. So if you let your flesh drive you, emotionally stir you, you haven't died enough. Don't get all upset about it. Just go to God and say, do something. Because your car doesn't tell you where to go. But your flesh will. So you got to crucify it because you're driving your body, not your body's driving you. Someone say, oh, me. So when you start your day off of prayer, you greet God, all right? A couple of points. Number one, those who seek him shall find him if we seek him with our whole heart. For blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. Two, at the end of the day, we pray. Casting our cares of the day over on him. Thank him for that day. And then we ask him to plead. We plead the blood of Jesus over our dreams and everything. And say, Father, I lock the night. 
That means Satan is not going to get in your night and your dreams and your sleep. He's not going to give you some kind of symptoms you wake up with in the morning. He's going to leave you alone. Because at that time, you've got two big old angels walk, just standing over you. See, most people don't know this. But you have two angels that follow you everywhere you go. Probably more. And when I do a series on angels, you really like it. But the angels stand, when you pray that prayer and you lock at night, God's angels stand over you, guarding you while you sleep. So you're not alone. They're guarding you. You just can't see them. Another thing about the light that comes off of you, you can't see that light. Rarely can you. I've seen it a few times. It's glorious. It's called the Shekinah glory of God. But Satan sees it. You have a light glory that's coming off you. It's kind of like you're in a bubble of light. If I can explain this to you. You're in a bubble of light. And everywhere you go, the light ball's covering you. And it goes down in the earth and under your feet. And Christ is sitting right there. If you could imagine, I wish I could draw a picture of it. You're walking around in a bubble of light and blood of Jesus covered in the presence of God. Now, are you going to stick your head out to the devil and go, la, 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 la. no, you're not. That's mocking. That's what scoffing is. You don't scoff. He's jealous of you already. You're going to heaven. He's going to hell. So you walk confidently through your day knowing what I told you is what the Bible describes. You're covered in a bubble of God. Now, if I had some of you who could get up off of the floor, I'd show you how it works. Because I've taken people with certain, we have, years ago, I did a lot of special classes on the anointing and everything. Taught YWAM and Tacoma, and the mercy ship leaders, how to move in the power of God. When you have this bubble, you can run into somebody else that has a bubble. And if you're both in tune, you, both of you will get slayed in the spirit. The power of God so strong. But the problem is, we're not God aware as much as we need to be God aware. Now, doesn't that you have to run on God on your mind all the time? No. But you need to have him on your mind so you never feel alone because you never are alone. But to feel alone is a deception. Hello. And I don't know about you, but Satan is the master of deception. So I don't bother to live with God by my head. I live with my heart like a child. That means when I make a mistake, David, I'm like a child. I'm sorry. <laughs> Amen. Forgive me. Children are, are not, unless, you know, they're in the wrong, but they're not normally mean. They have some meanness, but not normally. Let's move on. Okay, you with me? So at the end of the day, I learned to lock the day away. In Jesus' name. Let's go to the same scripture. Look at verse 6 through 8 of 63 of Psalms. Psalm 63, 6 through 8. When I remember you on my bed. I love that. I'm going to stop for a minute. Have you ever had a nice prayer session while you're laying in bed? I'm sure you probably have. Look at what this says. It's beautiful. I will remember you upon my bed. I will meditate you in the night watches. Because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. You are at the right hand. Your right hand upholds me. I follow close behind you. Now, what would that tell us? The Lord is my shepherd. What does sheep do? Do they lead the shepherd? They follow right along the shepherd. Pap nip his heels oftentimes. Right there. And the shepherd's always talking. So that the sheep recognize the tone and the sound of his voice. I told you, I don't know, it's been about a half a year. That when we say, Father, in Jesus' name, God recognizes our tone, our DNA, our entire personality when we come to him. It, I'm trying to just give you a little understanding. He knows us all by name and there's not a hair of our head that falls out. So if you can imagine, as soon as you say, Father, in Jesus' name, boom, it's Carrie. 
Hi, son. He's happy to see us. Well, how come God wasn't seeing us when we're walking through the day? Well, of course he is. You see, but when I go Father in Jesus' name, now I'm having a face-to-face. I'm right there face-to-face. Everything else is secondary. And now with a face-to-face, so God is so glad to see me, wants so bad to help me. And I go, oh, blah, 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 sit down, blah, 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 get up. And, and God goes, I want to say some things to you. I want to impart some of my presence to help you. I want to make you like a child again where you weep when people are hurt and you pray with such vast depth that the fires of hell shake. God wants to do that with all of us. You're his only special child. Don't call me a special child. You are. So Michael is God's special child. There's not another one like Mike. So Mike needs to take the time to be very personal with God and let God change inside. Don't look at your mom. That's not God. I know. I'm kidding you. And so when he does that, he'll sense change going on. Like I said, I've met Christians. I love them dearly. Uh, years, 40 some odd years ago, they have not grown. Oh, they can recite the Bible. Blah, 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 right? But they're constantly dealing with the same problems over and over again. And they're problems that they just ignore instead of really asking God to help them. God doesn't want us to be that way. He wants to help us through our day. He wants to be our best friend. He wants us to warm up with them so that he can show us the life. We're only tasting of some good things. Have you tasted to see the Lord's good? Can you imagine? For six days he made the earth. But 2,000, over 2,000 years, he'd been making a place for you. Can you imagine what it's going to be like? Hey, this is a garbage dump compared to it. And this, and the world is pretty. The earth is pretty. And streams and rivers and all these things are gorgeous. But they're only a small reflection of the perfection God has waiting for us. In my father's house are many mansions. I go, Jesus said, to prepare a place for you that where I am, you will be also. Thank you, Lord, for that. Amen. All right. So let's go to the second point. The Lord's prayer hitting the stations of life. All right, point two, Matthew chapter nine, please. The Lord's Prayer, hitting the stations of life. We all have these stations. There are more. Some people cover less. The idea is to give God every opportunity and every bit of invitation to come and work fully with you. Can you say amen? Your head will tell you, well, why would he do that for you and not someone else? He'll do it for everybody. That's what you get for thinking. Religion will not tell you you are wonderful to God. Religion will tell you you have to work hard to be accepted by him. That's religion. Every church, every man's religion in the entire world are man's efforts to try to reach up to God, including Judaism. When, if you look about it, the father reached down to us in Christianity and sent his son to where we are. So all man's religions are man trying to get to God when Christianity sent his son to get to man. See the difference? So so who would be the author of those religions? Now, I'm not talking about Lutheran. I'm not talking about Catholic. I'm talking about Mormonism, uh, Buddhism, Christianism. Those are all man's efforts to try to get to God and Satan took over. And you can see how he messed all of those things up. What's really weird though is all those demons those people fellowship with made some immense carvings all through India. And one day I'm going to show you some of those carvings. So you'll know that they were made by fallen angels when they were being worshipped by people of India. They went and carved all this giant megalithic stones. 
It wasn't the humans that did it. You know, it was the fallen angels that did it. That was going to be their homestead in the earth with all their pyramids, all their huge structures, all their underground cities were their hideouts from God to try to take over this planet. Old history. Way old history. But it's there. Blessed be the pastors that know how to answer those questions. You know, I happen to be one that can tell you what a UFO is, what a Bigfoot is, what all those structures are all about, where they came from, when they came. And you can too when you study the word. Well, why would I want to do that? Because you're going to run into some people. They're going to hit you. Well, what do you do, you Christians, about those pyramids? And all that, man, pop it right off. It says, God didn't make those pyramids. Fallen angels did to hide from God. That pyramid's a refueling station for one of his crafts. They come down, sit right on it, and the energy shoots right up in it. That's another story. I thought I would bait you with a little curiosity when in these days you'll write me or you'll ask some more questions about that. All right. So anyway, because it's, it's part of our, our scripture, these creatures lived on this earth before Adam and Eve. And God destroyed them. That's why there's only ruins, no equipment, and no creatures Aren't you glad he wiped the slate clean? Yeah. Amen. There's a bug on your window. Let's wipe it clean. All right. Here we go. All right. So here we go in Matthew. Uh, excuse me. On the Lord's Prayer. Okay. In verse 8. It says, Therefore, do not be like them. Now, what, what, what the thing was is the heathen, the people that didn't know God, thought they could get God's attention by chanting. God, 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 and doing chanting. We can see in Africa and some of those countries, they did chanting because the demons taught them to chant by the multitude of their constantly, they'll get God's attention. And God, if he's having a favorable day, might bless you. That's what he's addressing there. Be not like them, using much repetition and saying the same things over and over again. It says, it goes on, it says, whatever you stand, and it says, be not like them, for your father knows the things that you have need before you ask. Does God know everything you need? Why do we ask him? We have not because God never forces any blessing on you. He can't. Because if he pushes something on you that you didn't ask for, Satan has an accusation against him. God has to always be invited. So start inviting. How about your grandchild? He, does he know to invite God? Okay, grandma, start inviting for him. Hello. I'm just talking generally. Somebody did that for me. Look where it got me. <laughs> Probably saw me driving down the freeway. You know, doing all the wrong things. And said, God saved that man. And look, that's how it works. Asking God into areas that nobody's asking him into. Praying for people and asking God to save people that nobody's asking them to. Maybe a person doesn't know how to pray and say, God, help me. That's where you can step in by the spirit of God and pray that in. That's a nugget. When you see a brother that's sinning a sin that doesn't lead to death, you can pray and ask God for that soul, and God will turn him around. That's how powerful we are. This is a nugget Satan doesn't want you to do. He wants you so caught up in your problems, you haven't got time to pray for anybody else's need. Sound familiar. Okay. He knows what we have for before we ask. Our Father, which art in heaven, stations. So let me, I can do it by memory. So when you come to God, you come to God, Father, in Jesus' name. Then tell him, Father, you're in heaven. You're holy. I love you and I appreciate you. Just say it. And God will help you to get that out. Because sometimes your head will say, yeah, you don't really mean that. <laughs> Why the time when you're talking? And just say, Lord, I hallow your name. The name of Jesus, I lift it up. 
No other name given among men where be we must be saved. Acts 4. And Lord God, thank you so much. I lift up the name Yahweh. Yahweh. Lord God, the breathy name of you, Father. I lift up the Jehovah names. Those are man's names for the action of Jesus. Jehovah Nessie, Jehovah Jireh. You see, and you just can take that station and just start lifting his name. Just bless your name, Father. I just bless you. Just bless you. You're going to feel silly doing that. But that's not, your flesh needs to just shut up. Just do it anyway. Because when you're doing that, you're hitting your stations of life. First of all, you acknowledge God. Second of all, you acknowledge his name is above every name that's named. Third, you're acknowledging his kingdom and that his kingdom come. And this will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then you say, Lord, you're so faithful. You give us our daily bread. You supply all of our need according to your riches and glory. And then you just, you just talk around that station and you, and you pray. And Lord, lead us not into temptation. Lord God, don't let us be tempted by keeping us out of the flesh and walking in the spirit. Lord God, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. His lies, his tactics, everything that he might try to do will be wiser than that. And then you pray around that station. You see. Now maybe you never ever thought about this. And maybe you do. You know that's okay. But you'll find out about the time you hit all those stations. One hour is gone. You've covered everything. And then some. Just by having a conversation with God. That gives God long enough time. To get enough presence in you. And soak you enough. Where you're going to do some damage when you get up from that prayer line and walk off into your day. Otherwise, without that prayer, the devil starts smacking you around. He has got trigger words. People will say something, they misunderstand, and next thing you know, you're all dwelling on why they did this, how come, how come, why me, why me, I'm on, I'm on. Where's your mind on you? That's the deception. Get yourself off your mind. Hello. I got to say this. The reason why I look over there is, is you got the most honest looking faces. You know, so I, I wonder if your mom thinks, why does he peek over at me once in a while? Does she think I'm a sinner? No. <laughs> Just teasing you. You know, I have, but those of you coming in, Cam, I have Bible study over there, wonderful house. And, Hey Amen. If they thought that, that would throw me out on my ear. Anyway, sure love you. It's just one of those things that once we get this, you'll be able to instruct others. You'll be able to help them rise above. Because a lot of people, they'll tell you, I don't want to really follow God because every time I do, I get the tar beat out of me. Uh, this goes wrong and that goes wrong. See, the enemy's already working. They don't dare get close to God because then the enemy's going to pick on them. Just silly little games like that. How many know we get you most soaked with God? The enemy ain't going to be anywhere around you. You're too bright. You're too covered with the blood. You're too full of God for him even to stand you. See, we always think the devil will come and attack us. No, no. He threatens. Listen carefully. He threatens your strong points. But he attacks your weaknesses. So when you're doing good, he'll threaten it to try to get you to stop. And then he'll come around, try to get you at a weak spot. But listen, whenever you hear threats, and the enemy say, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to wipe you out. I had one lady call me up on the phone years ago, said she was going to drive her truck right up where the light don't shine. I mean, cursing at me and everything on the phone. Well, I know who was calling me, really. You know, and you'll say, well... You know, people will do all kinds of things. That's why our eyes are not to be on them. Because that same person that was acting like the devil yesterday can be saved today. That's why we keep praying for him. Say amen. Well, let's finish up with you, okay? So, the Lord's Prayer, stations. Take time each station. Father, in Jesus' name, station one. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. 
Your will be done, each station, see, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bre bread. Got the hiccups now. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver, you know, on each station. Take the time, at least a minute, and talk about it. And say, Lord, show me. Show me about what it means to lead me not into temptation. Show me what it means to guide my steps. Ask God to show you, show you, show you. Don't be one of those people that says that God's too busy for me to ask him. Show you, show you, show you. All right. Th third point. When praying, what are we to do? Forgive and release. And learn to break word chains. So let's go back to Ma Matthew. I think it's in Matthew. No, we're going to go to Mark 11. Mark 11, verses 25 through 26. Okay, he says, and whenever you stand praying, those of you that are sitting praying, this doesn't count. No, <laughs> it just means when you pray, when you are praying, if you have anything against anyone, what are we to do? Forgive him. That your father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. So if you sit and say, Lord, I want you to bless my son. But Lord, destroy his friends. <laughs> you, know, you, you see, you know, no, no. Anyway, you get the idea. Okay. <laughs> but if you do not forgive... Neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Jesus said it in a little different way. He said, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Now, he said it twice. One time about you binding things and other things by your actions you bind. So if we act as a Christian who have been forgiven of all our sins, haven't we? How dare we hold something against someone else for a little thing they did wrong? That binds us. Now you're bound on earth and God can't use you for that moment because you're all bound up because you dislike or you have unforgiveness towards somebody. I remember one time, this is a long time ago, and when my mom first got saved, she, she had a person that she just hated. Can't really do that. You have to give them to God and stay away from them. And I, I said, Mom, you're going to have to deal with that. And she says, I will never forgive them. Now, just feel how that feels when I say that. Now, she really did not mean that. But sometimes the enemy can set us up to get to a position we can forgive everybody but this person. You know what I mean? We have to forgive and you have to verbally forgive. Lord, I forgive them and I release them. Say that with me. I forgive everybody that's wronged me. In Jesus' name, say it. And I release them. Some of you felt a, a, like a, whew, that's a release. Because sometimes the enemy will rehearse in your mind things that they've done wrong. And then if we dwell on it, it'll irritate you. As a pastor, I can truly say that I have a lot of wonderful people I minister to. And some of them can do wrong. But I'm not going to sit every day and dwell on why they did that. Instead, I'm going to pray for them and love them. Try to, try to win them and, you know, restore them. But sometimes, you know, could be somebody at work, could be some situation, and your mind is just dwelling on it. Don't do that. It's just a distraction. Say amen. All right. Forgive your trespasses. So, number one. When we stand praying, we are to forgive anything and everyone that has come against us. Say amen. I said anything too, because sometimes somebody will do something. I have people who just don't like me, folks. And you know, I used to be a long time ago, I would tell you, don't listen to so-and-so, because they might tell you a couple of things. Wrong thing to say. People are going to say bad things about everybody all the time. Just they're not saved. They're, they just don't know any better. And if it's a Christian, they're in trouble when they do that. But listen. 
the words and things that people say can be used of the enemy sometimes to attack you. Let me tell you a story. I was driving from Bonnie Lake to Buckley, where my church was at that time in, in Buckley. And as I was driving, I was worshiping and singing in the spirit and loving God. And that car was just filled with the glory of God. Then all of a sudden, it was just like something cold and something really dead came right on into the car. And I said, oh, Lord, what's that? Did I grieve you? I didn't grieve you, did you? I don't know how I could grieve him, praising him and everything. And God says, no, people are talking about you right now. And I want you to take authority over it. <clears throat> I said, what? So they're licensing the enemy on you by gossiping about you. So just take authority over it. So he showed me instantly. Father, I take and I watch and listen. Every word spoken that's not your will for my life. In Jesus' name, I break the chains. All the gossip, all the slander, all of these negative things that people do and they don't know why they do it. I break its power. As soon as you do that, you'll feel a release. Because Satan needs some inroad to get to us. And if we don't give him because we're faithful in what we do, then he'll pick on somebody else. Hey, did you hear about Sherry? <laughs> And you got to have what this about Linda. <laughs> and then you get four or five people discussing it in a group. Now you got problems. So we just cleansed and break the word chains every so often. Could you say amen? So here's how you do it. Shall we do it? Say, Father, in Jesus' name, Father, in Jesus I break every word chain. Every word. every word spoken against me. That is not your will for my life. In Jesus' name. There. Woo. See, these are spiritual things that people don't address a lot in a, in a church. But you are my family. And I have the time to address these things with you. Our pastor taught us that when we're moving in and around the world, not everybody has a clean spirit. I said not everybody has a clean spirit. And some of those unclean spirits like the way you look because you're bright and shiny. And they'll say, let's go jump on Carrie. He hasn't been praying today and he's upset. Let's go ahead and ping off of Carrie, see if he keeps us. I know it sounds like Star Wars, but that's exactly how the enemy works. You come strutting through the store. You're having a great time. Things on sale. Suddenly you feel this ping and you get this pain in your head and you're going... What in the world is that? Somebody has been talking about you and it pinged you. Just rebuke. Just say, loose it. You know, do, 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 loose it. Jesus. Many times I've been in areas where the witchcraft had been so heavy, you could feel the heaviness. Just a quick rebuke and release wipes that whole thing right out. I mean, I've got plenty of adventures to tell you. I knew this fellow. He's gone on to be with Jesus. His name is Gary Keller. We used to drive for a year down to Portland, Oregon to teach a Bible study in Beaverton. Only four people would ever show up. There were nobody more than that. And I said, God, what do you have me driving all the way down here and doing all that? And God says, because I want to see if you're going to be faithful to me. I know you can, but will you? So I did it for an entire year. We never had so much fun in my life. So one time we were driving down past the the power station down there by St. Helens across the river. There's a power station on Washington side. And then you go down through St. Helens and up a little bridge and then up through and back into Beaverton through the back way. When we were doing it, we had, were plenty early. And so we we're being led by the spirit. We get in the car and the car would say, now I want you to take a right. God would say, take a right. We take a right. And he would say, now I want you to drive up the road, take the left up there. We take left telling us both. So we had lots of days of that going to Bible study. If you want days like that too, we'll teach you how that can happen. And so one day he just led us up over there and the wind were blowing and it was just starting to storm. We came over a hill and there was a guy standing in front of a barn with, with a satanic star on the barn. He was standing there with a pitchfork, long hair. It looked like Moses except for from the devil's side. 
And I says, God, what do you got us here for? He says, I want you to get out of the car and rebuke him and rebuke that coven. I says, okay. So him and, and Gary, we, Gary and myself got out of the car. We lifted up our voice and the winds picked up and the wind blew and shoved the, the uh, barn door, slammed it up against the, the guy, just freaked, ran into the barn. We just took a over everything and then you could feel the spirit of God go, whoosh. I looked at Gary, he looked at me, and he says, we're done here. Happened over dozens of times. It can happen to you. Don't be so superseding thinking that you're together when God's sending you to a store that you haven't been before. You're going on a mission. There's somebody there, somebody doing something. There's a stranger. Amen. Amen. And, uh, yeah, good. Amen. You're on a mission. Every day when you get up, you and God are on a mission. Take it that way. Amen. You don't always have the, the chance to pal around with Almighty God, do you? All right, let's finish up. So when you pray, forgive everybody. Okay? Just, just forgive. Release them. Amen. And break word chains. Remember, people don't might not always like, Mike, I'm sorry, but not everybody likes me. <laughs> I know you do. So people that don't like me or think evil of me, they're going to do this. Now, folks, you don't know much about witchcraft, and I don't want you to know anything. But witchcraft is run on words, too. You put spells on people through the words you speak. So, Hello. Christians have the power. Speaking evil against other Christians is what caused the revival in this end time to stop. God wants to restart it with a new breed of believers, just like he did the Israelites. The first generation died off because of their mealy mouths. The second generation was raised up because they chose to have a heart after God. It's the heart after God. Everything else is secondary. Don't chase things. Chase God and God will give you everything that you need. Say amen. Final point. Blocking Satan's inroads. Blocking all the inroads of the devil. First starts off in prayer. Then you're covered. When we pray, what happens? When I go to the Father in Jesus' name, I'm covered in the blood, covered in the armor, filled with the presence, covered in his presence, covered with Jesus What's the devil have? But we are not aware of it a lot of times. We just think it's Christianity. Mm -mm. You're a child of Almighty God. So to block Satan's inroad, you have to be a person of prayer, a person that forgives, a person that lets things go. Don't dwell in your head with God, dwell in your heart like a child. That will keep you innocent and bring you back to forgiveness and cleansing and being soft. The world wants to make us hard, wants to toughen us up. We gotta be us, we gotta be me and all this kind of stuff. When God says, you need to die and let me be you in you and make you into the person that I originally planned you to be. And that's what God is trying to do with us if we will allow it, say amen. So we block Satan's in row. Go with me to Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, trickeries, cunning craftiness of the devil. There, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. It's talking about a position in Christ. Having to all to stand, stand. Now that's not you standing out in the front of the Titanic. Looking over the edge of the water before your life is going to end. That's not you. You're standing in God. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Satan has lost you. So he's not going to leave you alone until you learn to shut all his inroads off. You do it by a dedicated prayer life. 
And don't think prayers work. Think it is a pleasure that you get to be with Almighty God. Two, forgive easily. People are going to wrong you. Some people go out of their way to irritate you. Forgive them instantly. Say, Lord, I forgive them, that goof, and move on. When you start to do this, you break Satan's inroads. Now, I'm coming back to my last point, and then we're done with you. Okay. Before you cook a meal, and you're in the kitchen, and you're preparing a meal for your family, what is the first thing you do? You wash your hands. When you're with God, what's the first thing you do? You wash yourself in his presence. So, if you are like me, and we travel and we visit people, not everybody's saved. Not everybody's saved like we are saved. They don't know as much. They're just, maybe they're saved, but they haven't got cleaned up yet. They have company. I call them boogaloos. Change mood swings and things like that and all that kind of thing. And so when you're around people of the world and you got that worldly dust and dirt on you because of the words and the things and you found yourself stretching the truth a little bit and all that kind of stuff, this stuff gets on you. It says that keep yourself unspotted from the world. So, so to share this with you is whenever you're around people that are not in, on fire with God, rebuke after you leave. It's the washing of the hands. You see, I had an uncle, bless his heart. He would love to flip Jesus off every time I would come to his house. He would do it just for me. And of course, that would just set me off and I'd get all irritated. I'm just telling a story of my young life. And he just loved to get me irritated and everything like that. And then when I'd leave, I'd have a headache. And I wouldn't feel right. And here's one of these God. And I says, God, I'm going to rebuke this. Loosen me. Let me go. As soon as I did that, everything went. Boo. My uncle's boogaloo wanted to follow me home. <laughs> Finally, he got saved. But, oh, it was terrible. Go, go with my folks over to visit my uncle and everything like that and, and know that I'm going to deal with headaches and cussing and foul stuff and everything like that, which is something I used to be a part of, but I'm no longer a part of. And so when I would leave, learn to wash. Lord, loosen that, Lord. I rebuke anything that might have follow me home. When you're around people that are not of the same religion, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, all that, they have Klingons too. So when you pull away from them, you might feel something that's not normal. Just wash your hands, rebuke. That's normal Christianity. Hello. But you're not taught that in church. You know, these are little things that Satan uses to keep tripping us up. So hopefully you will give up. And not serve God. All right. So little nuggets. So we know now when we pray, what are we to do? Forgive. Father in Jesus name. And then forgive everybody before you start praying. Well, I don't know. You will know when you mention somebody's name. If you have odd against them. Okay. Because when you, when you say, Father, I want to pray for so and so. You'll have an immediate feeling if there's something there that's not right. Just say, Lord, cleanse me of that. I don't want to think that way about him. Just like that. It's just taken care of. The idea is we don't walk with God throughout the day like we should. We greet with God and then we just let God be God. And we're just doing our own thing. And I'm not putting any of that down. But that's not what Christianity is about. God wants you to have a full, blessed wonderful life but he wants you to, to run according to the pattern he's got laid out for you and not according to the way you do it I did it my way and God says that's why you're here 10 years earlier than you should be you did it your way 
So as Christians, we don't do things our way. We go to God and say, Lord, within the things that you want me to do, show me which ones are important, which ones are not. Therefore, the scripture is written, it says, when you run a race, cast off the weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with joy the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So all of you are wonderful, beautiful children of God. But you won't stay that way if you, you don't keep up certain disciplines. Now, they're not works. They're just things. Folks, as much as I love you, you'll like this one. If you don't take a shower in a week, I'm going to be staying away from you. If going to God every day is like showering. You stay fresh. Going to God once in a while when you did something wrong is like sandbagging after the flood has come. Hello. Amen. So yeah, am I talking to you? Yeah, I'm talking to you. But you are God's best. So, are you ready? Now these are the holidays. What happens usually in the holidays? People drink too much. They drive too much. They get angry too much. They do things they kind of question about. And so we cut that out of your life and do the Jesus thing and you'll have the best Christmas you ever had in your life. Amen? Amen. Because you are God's chosen. All right. Did you get something out of that this morning? Amen. I know I talk a lot, but here we go. So Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, watch over you. May his face shine upon you. May his eyes give you insight so you may see a clear path to walk. May you learn to daily ask God to cleanse you and wash you so that you become like a child of innocence again and that your heart be filled with joy and overflow with confidence. May God bless you with the fact that he is in you, he is around you, he is for you, and he's with you. So the Lord bless you in Jesus' name and keep you this wonderful day. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. amen. 